Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're in the middle of summer, right? Summer just started, um, so we're starting a new sermon series, and I thought it would be very appropriate to start something called Minor Leagues, not just because we're in the middle of baseball season, uh, but because it kind of goes along with the minor prophets of the Bible. And, and typically, we don't focus too much on the minor prophets, do we? Typically, we maybe focus on the big prophets, but we focus a lot on the New Testament, and we maybe read from the minor prophets a couple times a year, but we really don't hear what God says there. So over the next couple of weeks, each week we're going to be looking at a different minor prophet. One prophet a week, kind of, we'll have some verses from the prophet, but we'll kind of be looking at the, the, whole, uh, the whole book at a time. So I encourage you to kind of read along with us. And, and we'll see that uh, our kind of tagline is minor prophets throwing strikes. Because uh, they have a lot of pointed words for us. They have a lot of pointed words for God's people. Uh, but it's also called waiting for redemption because there's also a lot of hope and promise, not just for God's people a couple thousand years ago, but for God's people here today in Tampa, Florida. So each week, a different prophet. Um, I hope you kind of read along with us, and I, I hope God kind of speaks to you in this. And this week, we're going to be looking at the book of Hosea. Now, is there any Hosea experts out here? Right? Anybody have any Hosea verses memorized? Probably not, right? It's, it's not, like I said, it's not a book that we, we typically look at, but Hosea is a very interesting book because Hosea is called by God to be a prophet. And right at the very beginning of the book of Hosea, God tells Hosea, he says, Hosea, I want you to take a wife. Her name's Gomer. And we say, man, it's a sweet love story, right? It's this, uh, Hosea is getting married, you know, they're going to the chapel or whatever. This is an exciting book. We're all happy and we're feeling good. And then we read about who Gomer actually is, right? And some of you maybe have heard this. And um, this is from Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. So right at the beginning of the book, God says to Hosea, Go and marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So Gomer's a, a winner, right? She's, she's a wonderful wife. Um, I'll have to tell you, this is the NIV. In our pew Bibles, and what Ed just read, that was from the ESV. And I had to put the NIV on the screen because I don't know if the word that the ESV translates for promiscuous woman is appropriate to be read in church. That's the type of woman she is. She's, she's a woman of the night, you could say. That was her profession. Um, she's not a very faithful woman. And God says, Hosea, I want you to marry that woman of the night, that promiscuous woman, and I want you to have some children with her. And we say, okay. Gomer, his, uh, his wife, is sort of like Israel. They'd been unfaithful. But it gets worse. He says, you're going to have two children. And the names of the two children, now get this, if you were uh, a husband and God told you to tell your wife this is what you needed to name your kids, how would you respond? Because the name of the two children no mercy and not my people. So he says, go and have, have these two children. It's kind of awkward looking kids. These aren't the kids. I found, I typed an awkward kid photo on Google, and this is what came up. But it's some awkward names, right? Can you imagine a seventh grader, you know, what first day of school? Well, what's your name? No mercy. Is no mercy here? Is, is not my people here, right? They, they probably got made fun of all the time. But, but God says, you know, Hosea, go take Gomer, this unfaithful, promiscuous woman, to be your wife, and you're going to have two children by her named No Mercy and Not My People. For this is how the nation of Israel, my people, have, have been. They, they're not acting like my people. They've been promiscuous. They've gone after the gods of their heart. And basically, God shouldn't show them any mercy. He says that, you know, that the reign of the Assyrians is coming and God's going to show no mercy. So Hosea's family kind of becomes this living parable of, of Hosea's message in the book. And you might say, well, the, the, the point of the book, if you didn't know the story, you might guess what the story was and say, well, Hosea is full of God's love and faithfulness and he's going to keep loving his wife. And because of that love, his wife is going to turn around and become this wonderful, faithful wife and this faithful woman and a, a great mom to know mercy and not my people. Well, Hosea loves Gomer, this promiscuous woman of the night, but guess what? She doesn't change. 
She keeps going back to her old ways. She keeps going after other men, even though she's married. And as she's doing this, she accumulates quite a bit of debt. So in order for her to come back home to Hosea, somebody has to pay off the debt. And like I said, God said this is kind of how the nation of Israel is. And then God goes to Hosea once again. And this is what he says to Hosea. As she's gone off once again with these other men of the night and accumulated all these debts, he says, go and show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and have loved the sacred raisin cakes. So God says, Hosea, keep going and showing this love. Go, uh, go pay off her debts. Go bring her back home. This is kind of how God is. Even though she's like an adulterous woman, or like the adulterous people who have gone after these other gods and their sacred raisin cakes. Now, side note there, right? I was really excited this morning. I had a little extra pep in my step this morning because I had a really special breakfast this morning. I don't know if you've ever had raisin cakes. Anybody ever had a raisin cake before? Some of you, Bruce back there has had raisin cake. I, I brought some with me here. Have you ever had the sacred raisin cakes? The, the cinnamon raisin bread? This stuff's good, right? Side note here, because look at what, look at what Hosea is saying. He's, he's saying they, these, these Israelites who have been unfaithful to their God, they've gone after these other gods and the sacred raisin cakes. They've been eating this raisin bread. Now, I guess I can't have my breakfast anymore, right? I'm, I'm done with that stuff. I can't, I can't eat it, right? It's, 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 it's the raisin cakes, and I've gone after the raisin cakes. You know, it's, it's good stuff. But, but this is kind of the parable for God's people. They had been unfaithful. They, they were, during this time, under the, the uh, reign of King Jeroboam II, who was a very unfaithful king. He led his people and allowed his people to, to worship um, this god of fertility, um, the god of Baal. And he was this god that basically they would worship and they would say, you know, uh, you are the god that gives us our fertility. You are the god of the harvest that brings us our harvest. It is not Yahweh. It's not the Lord, but it's this false god. And kind of in an act of worship, what they would do is they would take their fruit, right, that, that, that this false god had given them, that this god of Baal had given them, and they would bake them into cakes, right, fruit cakes or raisin cakes. And they would go and they would pick up their raisin cakes, and I threw this a little farther than I was supposed to, and um, they, would, they would eat their raisin cakes. And basically, as they ate these raisin cakes, what they would do is they would say, the fruit that has gone into this raisin cake came from this false god. So it wasn't that eating raisin bread is bad, but as they ate the raisin cake, it was kind of false worship because they were saying it doesn't come from the true God, the God that gives us everything, but it comes from this this false god, this god of the harvest, this god of Baal. So that's the question for today. For you and me, what are your raisin cakes? What are the things that you have run after in your life? Right? What, what are those things in your life? It, I don't think it's probably raisin bread, right? It's probably not raisin bread, but maybe for you, where you're, where you're running after false gods, maybe it's the, the God of your 401k plan, right? Where you say, you know, I got to have enough stuff there. Or maybe it's the God of your family, saying, you know, I got to have the perfect family. Or maybe it's the God of a, of a person, saying, I got to have the relationship with that person. Or maybe it's something else. But I think the big question that, that Hosea really asks is, who do you attribute your faithfulness or your fruitfulness to? Who do you attribute gives you all of that stuff? Gives you what's in your 401k plan? Gives you, um, you, you know, your new car? And I think typically what we say as, as Christians, we go, oh, well, I know the answer to that, pastor. God gives me everything, right? God, God's the one who gives me everything. And we say that piously. We say, yeah, God, God is the one who gives me everything. We just said it as we read uh, Luther's explanation to the first article of the creed. He gives me, gives me everything. But do you really believe that? 
Because I think deep down in our sinful hearts, uh, we don't, right? And I think a good test for that is if you were to lose your fruitfulness, right? If you were were to lose your raisin cakes, if all of a sudden your 401k plan were to go from being enough to retire on to being absolutely zero, how would you feel? Would you be like Job and say, the Lord gives, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord, God's going to take care of me tomorrow? Or would you be like, ah, right? I, I put money in that 401k, put every paycheck for the 40-some years of my career, and, and now it's nothing. Like, I worked hard. That's my money. Where'd it go? And all of a sudden, who's the God that's giving you your raisins? Is it the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Or is it the God of your own heart and your own work ethic? If you were to all of a sudden be saving away for this car, and, and as soon as you were able to buy this car, boom, somebody totals it. You say, oh, oh well, it's just another car. You know, I'm, I'm get another one, I'll ride the bus. Or would you say, oh, I saved all this money for this car, and I worked hard, and it's mine. You know, if you, if you had a spouse, and, and you worked, you know, you, you thought you were loving her and working for her, and all of a sudden things fell apart, you say, oh, this is, this is bad. Are, are you putting pressure on yourself? Because so many times that's what we do, and before we know it, our God isn't the true God, but our God is ourselves. We're attributing somebody else for giving us our fruitfulness. So, so the question for you is, what is your raisin cakes, and who is giving you the raisins? Because I think so many times we don't trust in the true God. And if you look at the book of Hosea, as he's calling out the nation of Israel to this idolatry, they're they're like promiscuous women of the night running after these other gods and and chowing down on their their fruitcakes. He says it's not good. If you read the book of Hosea in its entirety, he talks about this destruction that's going to come, this Assyrian empire that's going to come and pretty much wipe them out. And in the northern tribes of Israel, it's true. Just a short while later, the Assyrians come, wipe them out, we never hear from them again. It's doom and gloom. And it's true for us, right? The the Apostle Paul talks about this. He says the wages of our sin, the wages of our unfaithfulness, is death. Right? Death isn't a good thing. We've been like promiscuous women of the night with our God, and we've run after our own gods. and, And death is coming. It's not a good thing. It's separation from our God. It looks bleak. And we look at the names of our our children of Hosea, not my people. We don't act like God's people. And no mercy. It appears as if God's not going to show us mercy. But here's the thing. As we we hear these, these strikes that come straight at us in the book of Hosea, he has some promises for us as well. You know, we're never going to have it all together. We're, we're never going to be able to turn from our idolatry completely. But this is what God says he's going to do. And he says this right at the beginning as he's introducing us to Hosea's children. I love this. It was right at the beginning of our reading in uh, chapter 2. And God says, and I will have mercy on no mercy. Right? That child that we named no mercy, God's going to have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, which is a child's name, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. God is going to be faithful. God's going to bring us into the fold. God's going to get us back to be his fruitful people. And I love the the last chapter of Hosea is Hosea chapter 14. And this is kind of how he ends his book as he's describing his unfaithful people, the people of Israel, the people of Tampa, the people like you and me today. He says, I will, hear, I will heal their apostasy, and I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall be spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive, and his fragrance like Lebanon. Now that's poetry there, right? That's, that's Hebrew poetry. And here you see Hosea, or God speaking through Hosea, saying, you know, I'll be like dew in a new morning to Israel. 
I'll bring them new life. And we, we see that, that, that God shows to people who don't deserve mercy, to people who don't act like his people, this mercy and this love as he comes and he's born of a woman on Christmas and he lives this life and he lives amongst his, idol, his people that are full of idolatry. And he runs after them and he loves them so much that he takes on the wages of our sin and he dies for us, that we might be called his people. And that death, that separation, isn't the last word because he's raised to life. And that's what Christ has done for you and me. That's what our merciful God has done for us. He has shown mercy to no mercy. He has made not my people his people. He has shown mercy to you and me. He has made people who don't act like his people his people. And he calls us to bear that fruit even though we might not attribute our fruitfulness to him, he, he, he wells up in us and calls us to bear that fruit to our neighbor. And that's what way back in the Old Testament, he called Abraham to bear this fruit and be a blessing to the nation. Now he uses you and me as he's filled us up with his mercy and his grace to bring that love and that mercy to maybe people that don't think they're God's people so that they too might experience the mercy of God. And that's God's promise in Hosea. It's this wonderful beauty a beautiful story of God and his love for us, how he keeps loving us, how he keeps coming after us and forgiving us and making us bear fruit for him in his kingdom. And I love how Hosea, the very last verse of Hosea is 14 verse 9. And this is, this is, this is how, it's, uh, how it's summed up. He says, Wise will listen to these words and understand them, but the foolish will stumble over them. So are you going to listen to the words of Hosea? The gist of it is we are unfaithful. We can't get it right. But our God is so full of mercy and love. He's the one that makes us right. He buys us back as Hosea, Hosea does for Gomer. He pays us our debts and he makes us his people. So that we too and through us, he can use us to, to bring his love to people who desperately need his mercy and grace. So know, even as you've run away, that your God has paid your debt and he has brought you back and you are now his people. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.